All right, I'm gonna say this for the third time. I'm sorry, we were having some audio issues. I just wanted to say um, that welcome for those of you that are watching remotely, Dr. Tran, Dr. McDaniel and others. I'm, I, I can't tell you how excited I am to have you with us. Um, so you're probably going to hear some things that you haven't heard before. For, for the residents that are listening in, you've probably heard a version of this, but it has been significantly updated. So I think we're all going to learn something today. And what I tried to do is I made it very case-based so that when you're looking at these numbers and you're looking at your patients, you can think of how do I apply this knowledge that Dr. Jenkins is giving me to the patients sitting in front of me. So I've given this talk to the FAFP. I actually went to Gainesville and gave it at Grand Rounds there. I gave it at Grand Rounds here. This is something that I'm very passionate about and you'll see why, but I, I think everyone in this room is gonna learn something new that will significantly impact patient care. So really like, you know, get ready. Dr. Brennan, you, you broke the no back row rule, but it's okay, I'm gonna forgive you. No back row today. So you got you gotta move up. Yeah, you gotta move up. Okay. See, I even do it to the <laughs> Oh geez. <laughs> so <clears throat> yeah, yeah. The main learning objectives for today is for you guys to feel very, very comfortable with these three terms. So I'm gonna show it to you right at the beginning. So when we talk about it, you guys are like, those are the three terms. That's what we're trying to learn today. APO lipoprotein B, which we also abbreviate as APO B. Lipoprotein little a, which we abbreviate as LP little a. And CAC, like a CAC score or your coronary artery calcium score. We're gonna talk about those three things. I'm also gonna, I, I gave all of you one of these kind of laminated cards. So you can reference it during the talk. You can have it in your pocket to kind of go over with patients when we talk about this. So as we go through the cases, just kind of take a look at that. And why is this important? So LDL, when you look at it in a lab, is an LDL cholesterol. It's not telling you exactly what's happening and what your patient might be at risk for. And the reason is LDL, there's a difference between an LDL cholesterol and an LDL particle, which we're gonna talk about. But there's a lot more lipoproteins that are gonna potentially cause atherosclerotic disease. And so last time I checked, <clears throat> heart disease was still the number one killer of men and women. So this is very relevant beyond the LDL particle, which we're all very familiar with, you also need to know about VLDL. So remember VLDL, I am not gonna ask you to know which ones carry what and where they come from and where they're depositing. I don't even think it's that important. But VLDL is a very triglyceride rich lipoprotein. So think about our obese patients, our metabolic syndrome patients, our diabetic patients. This is a very important lipoprotein in those particular patients. And so it's just as atherogenic and as high risk as an LDL particle. So if you're just looking at LDL, you're not really getting the full picture, but we're going to talk more about that. So for those of you who have never heard these terms before, you're probably like, well, why not? Like I, um, I'm practicing standard of care medicine. We're taught that we're looking at mainly LDL and HDL and we're treating LDL goals. Well, I'm here to tell you that it is in the guidelines. So these are the 2018 American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association guidelines. It's just kind of buried. So we're going to talk about this a little bit. And these guidelines are going to change and they've already changed. I'm going to be showing you that. So this is a little bit of old news, but this is what we're currently using. So when we look at our patient, um, and there's going to be certain patients that automatically are high risk and that we're going to treat differently. So we already are doing diabetics. Like we see a diabetic, we know that they're at much higher risk for having a stroke and a heart attack. So automatically our diabetic patients were putting on statins, right? Like that's something we just do because we know that's a risk enhancing factor. 
The other thing in our guidelines is patients with an LDL-C above 190. And the reason is, if they have an LDL-C above 190, chances are they have familial hyperlipidemia, which is genetic. And so these are the folks that, if they're homozygous and they have these astronomic LDL cholesterols, they're going to have stroke and heart attack in their 30s and 40s, at way earlier than what we're used to seeing. And then we have this ASCVD risk calculator, which many of you are familiar with. For those of you, if you're not familiar, it's an app on your phone now that you can use. But there's definitely limitations to this risk calculator, and so we're going to talk about that. But basically, you plug in their age and their ethnicity and their gender and some of their blood pressure and cholesterol numbers, and they get put into these buckets. And so that's why I put this on your card so you can kind of remember the different buckets that we have like a borderline and a low risk and a high risk. So <clears throat> there's limitations in that this score is driven heavily by ethnicity and gender and age up until about the age of 50, 60. So there, if you're, you're, you're missing a subset of population that may have other risk factors that are at very high risk for having events in their 30s and 40s, but if we use this calculator, we're going to miss it. We're, we're just going to miss it. And then way to the left, in the tiny little letters, you see the ASCVD risk-enhancing factors. So this is where the 2018 guidelines started to introduce us to the concept of apolipoprotein B and lipoprotein A. So we're going to talk more about those two things, but I just wanted to point out that they're there. <laughs> it's there, and this is where we started to see it. It's also where we started to kind of recognize that high triglycerides, renal disease, people with inflammatory conditions, these are also people that have high risk, just like our diabetics and our smokers. And this is just to show you that we really need to be more diligent about patients with an LDL above 190. So I, I see this quite often that we'll have a patient where their LDL is 200 or 210, and we're like, okay, maybe that's diet, maybe that's, um, you know, maybe, maybe they could do a trial of eating less McDonald's or whatever it is. No, this is genetic. A lot of times diet lifestyle is not gonna have a significant impact on this. It's really, really important that we one, identify it and that we also get them on a medication. So try to um, just be more cognizant of that. And a lot of these patients don't even know that they have potentially have a genetic factor to their high cholesterol. My, my husband included, I found out recently his last, uh, his LDL a couple of years ago was 200s. And so that that is not because he has a bad lifestyle that is most likely genetic. Maybe he has a bad lifestyle. <laughs> so, so let's start with the case. All these cases are actual patients of mine. So if you have questions, kind of slow me down. And I, I tried to simplify the cases, but I have a 53-year-old Caucasian female with hyperlipidemia, GERD, prediabetes. She's on famotidine and she was on rosuvastatin on Crestor, but you know, she doesn't want to be on a statin. A lot of our patients, right? Like Doc. Do I have to be on rosuvastatin or Crestor? Like, do I really need it? She does have a family history of high cholesterol, but not of heart disease. Her vitals are here. She doesn't have hypertension. Her weight, she's a little fluffy, but you know, who's, who's not, who's not fluffy? So if you look to the left, this is what we would traditionally look at. So a couple of things jump out, right? We see that her LDL is 188. It's not above 190, so she's not kind of hitting that box to be genetic. Her triglycerides are a little bit high. She's got this inflammatory marker, the CRP, so she's got some inflammation. But we calculate her ASCVD risk score, and she's 2.1. So what do we do with our patients that are in the 2.1 range? Nothing. Yeah. Yeah, like let's you know, let's just do a Mediterranean diet and lose weight and get you exercising and all those things. If we take it a step further and we do advanced lipid testing, which by the way, for those of you that are not familiar, 
It is in Cerner, it's called advanced lipid panel. <clears throat> it is covered by insurance. It is not that expensive. And so that's been the rate limiting factor for a lot of physicians is they're nervous about the cost to the patient. You can order a lipoprotein little a and an ApoB separately, and they're like maybe $20. They're not that expensive. It's definitely covered if they have a family history and they have hyperlipidemia. So I did her advanced lipid panel, and you don't have to understand what all these numbers mean. I, I would say I just really want you to understand the two words. So if you look there, her lipoprotein little a is 18, which is normal. We're going to talk more about that. But her apolipoprotein B is 137, which is high. So what in the world does that mean? <laughs> All right. So cholesterol, when, when you do your labs, you're, you're seeing an LDLC, which is LDL cholesterol. Cholesterol is hydrophobic, so it doesn't travel in the blood. It has to travel in these. Look, I have like a little show and tell. Mm -hmm. It has to travel in these lipoproteins and these spheres. And every single one of these, except for HDL, I'm just going to skip to that. Every single one of these, except for HDL, has this blue blob on it. So it has this thing called ApoB. They all have one, ApoB. So what's important is not the amount of LDL cholesterol. These are two different patients. They both have an LDL cholesterol of 130, okay? So on the left, they're carrying around their LDL cholesterol in smaller lipoproteins. And there's more of them because if you have to take a thousand kids to Bush Gardens, you can either put them on school buses and you're going to have bigger buses with more kids on them, or you're going to put them in Volkswagen Beetles, and you're going to need a lot more Volkswagen Beetles to get them to Bush Gardens, right? So if we're carrying around an LDL cholesterol of 130 and we're using little lipoproteins, you need more of them. There's going to be a lot more. And what we know about atherosclerosis and what we're discovering in research, it's not the amount of cholesterol. It's the number of particles. Does anybody have a question about that? It's not, you have a question? The sphere. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep talking about it because it takes a little bit to kind of understand. So it's not the cholesterol. So the person on the right has an LDL cholesterol of 130, but they have bigger particles, bigger spheres. So they have less. So how do we know how many particles somebody has instead of measuring the particle number? Well, we can tell by measuring ApoB because if you measure ApoB, there's one ApoB for every single particle. So if it's high, if the ApoB is high, you've got the person on the left. You have somebody that has a lot of those particles floating around in the blood there's more opportunities for that to touch the endothelium and to cross over and to get eaten up by the macrophage and cause the fatty streak and all that kind of stuff. So we know through research, the particle size and number are more important than the LDLC in your lab. Does that make sense? This is a very, we're, we're gonna keep talking about it, but so ApoB is more accurate than LDL. And a lot of the guidelines are moving that way. Um, so instead of looking at LDL, and LDL is still very important, but instead of just looking at LDL, we all should start to kind of think more about ApoB because that's catching the people. So for the, the example I gave you, her LDL is 188. Like we're already kind of worried about her anyway. But there are gonna be patients where the LDL is 130 and is pretty normal but they're very high risk and we're missing them. So it's really important. You're gonna miss part of the picture because there's a lot more than LDL. There's VLDLs and there's IDLs and there's lipoprotein little a. All of these are atherogenic. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. What, uh, so are they quantified? Yeah, they're measured differently the, um, and the numbers are different. So to, for, for making it like an intro to lipidology, it's just easier to do ApoB and a lot of the emerging research, they're using ApoB as a target and not particle number. Um, but you'll see that if you do the full panel, not only will the apolipoprotein B be elevated, but the particle number will be elevated. And the problem is the particle number here that you're seeing is the LDL particle number. So it doesn't have IDL and VLDL and all the all these other things in it. So you should look at ApoB. Like so ApoB. The ApoB is bigger centimeters versus kilometers. Like it's uh, nanometers, yeah, like tiny, tiny, right. tiny, tiny, tiny measurements. Yes, yes, yes. So it's a different scale, is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good question. Okay. So question we're going to keep going through cases. The gallery. I hear somebody online. Is that Dr. Tran? Hey, how's it going? Hey, what you got? Uh, so when you get the advanced lipid uh, panel, how do you and the patient like reviews their results. How do you counsel them through like the particle number, the small, medium, large, the pattern, peak size, all yeah, that jazz? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to send you an email, but I gave out these little like pocket cards. And so um, I usually try to explain to patients that there's different particles besides just LDL cholesterol. And that, um, you know, I show them a picture. So I'm going to send this to you, but this is going to make more sense as we go through the talk. So I'm going to come back to that. But you're right. There is some patient education that goes through that you have to go through. I also have an auto text and there's websites. And so I can get you guys all that information, but you want to make it as simple as possible. So I usually show patients the picture of the different particles. And I just explained to them that measuring your cholesterol is not really the whole picture. So this is another patient, 58-year-old Caucasian male with hypertension, sleep apnea, low T, prediabetes, and he's on a calcium channel blocker, an ARB, and his testosterone injections. He does have a family history. His dad had a heart attack in his early 60s. His mom had Alzheimer's in her 60s. They're now calling Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes, so there's a lot of interrelated risk factors there. His vitals are there, maybe a little borderline blood pressure and heart rate, but <clears throat> ASCBD risk score, if you calculate it, is 6.6, .6, which puts him in the borderline category. And we look at his, you know, LDL, and what do you think of his LDL? Is that impressive? Nah. I mean, this is probably somebody, what, what really makes you worry about this guy is his family history. So, you know, his family history would probably have you a little bit alarmed, but if he was like, doc, I don't want a statin, and he's falling in the borderline category, and you're just looking at LDL, his triglycerides are okay, his HDL is okay. So traditionally, we would probably tell this guy, all right, it might be reasonable to try lifestyle, right? But if you go further and you look at his apolipoprotein B, it's elevated. So there's more to him than just what you're seeing with the initial testing. And this is something that, again, is in a lot of the journals that I know is hard to keep up with. But the earlier we identify patients as having an elevated ApoB, the better job we're going to do reducing events. And so we've got to find this earlier. Yeah. Um, so I noticed that it's it was high, but yeah. what range are we talking about? Ah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Good question. All right. It depends. It depends. So if you look at the 2018 guidelines, they're going to have a much more conservative number. But a lot of the cardiologists and lipidologists are going to tell you about 80. So that's generally the goal is 80 or less is where you're trying to shoot for, especially if they're high risk and they have some other risk factors. And it gets above 80 and 100. That's when you want to start worrying about other things that are going on. But this can be hard, right? Because now, now that we're going to, you know, we're learning more and we're identifying more patients, 
<clears throat> they're like, Doc, I've heard those statins, like they cause dementia or they're going to make my foot fall off. Or I, I don't know. I read on there was a TikTok about statins and <clears throat> they're really, really bad for me. So we have to get better at kind of understanding the the what the real risk with statins, which is very, very minimal and the supportive research behind statins and how they lower the risk of events. And so we're doing a terrible job, is what this graph shows. So the orange line, which is kind of the easier one, these are our diabetic patients. We know they're higher risk. They should all be on a statin. You can see from the graph that we're getting better. It's getting up into the about 50%. But So half of our diabetics are on a statin. It's OK. It probably could be better. But you look at these other numbers, and, and these are the folks where we have opportunities. So even in patients who have had a stroke or a heart attack or peripheral or arterial disease, maybe 30% at best are on a statin. And then our patients that are in this um, intermediate risk category, um, maybe 20 or less percent. So we, we have some opportunities. Please know where to look and who to ask. So there's good sources of information and not great sources. If you don't want to look on PubMed and look at all the literature, there are some fantastic podcasts. This is Dr. Lipid on Twitter. He's part of the National Lipid Association. So this is a very good resource. Um, so just make sure you're kind of looking for good resources. So when our patient says, Doc, I had a patient today, like, Doc, I've tried statins. Um, I, I'm statin intolerant. They don't want to keep me. Um, there is a lot you can do to try and help your patients overcome those barriers to getting on a statin, because this is where we start. We always start with a statin. One is trying to figure out if they need a high intensity or a low intensity. We're going to talk more about that. It's only two statins that we can do that with. But if they've had myalgias, who here knows that there are lipophilic and hydrophilic statins? There's two different, yeah. So, so those of you that have heard this talk before, there are two different categories of statins. Why does that matter? Because all of the muscles and organs in our body have a phospholipid bilayer. So if you have a lipophilic statin, it may be more likely to cause myalgias. And so I'm saying maybe because that's not always the case. So how in the world do we remember which statins are the ones that are less likely to cause myalgias? And these are going to be the ones that are um, not lipophilic. They're actually hydrophilic, so water loving. So the way that I teach people how to remember these statins are Crestor is like a crest of an ocean wave. So that might help you remember that Crestor is good because it's hydrophilic. And then there's the PP statins. So the PP statins are also hydrophilic, um, and that is pravastatin and patavastatin. So those are the three main statins that you want to try and use if your patient has had myalgias. You also, if they're having trouble, they're like, Doc, you, you, you know, the pharmacist told me to take it at night, and I, I'm just having trouble remembering that. A lot of the long-acting statins, like atorvastatin and um, rosuvastatin and livolo, which is patavastatin, they do not need to be taken at night. So you don't have to have your patient take them at night. Tell them to take it in the morning or whenever they're more likely to remember it. So 69-year-old female with hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and some anxiety. She's on a low dose of amlodipine, and she's on red yeast rice. She prefers more holistic medications, which is okay. Her father had um, a heart attack and a, and a bypass and, you know, lots of coronary artery issues in his early 60s. This is her blood pressure. It's a little bit elevated, and her BMI is normal. So when we look at her labs, her LDL is 138, um, but her HDL, I don't think I put it on here, her H, oh yeah, it is 95. So in the past, doctors have told her that she has a favorable risk ratio and that she's okay. Please never ever base cardiovascular risk assessment on an HDL to LDL ratio. That is meaningless. There's no research behind that. And we know that treating HDL and elevating HDL 
does not lower your risk for heart attack and stroke. So just don't ever tell people that. <laughs> and so, of course, I did the other testing because she saw me and her, her ASCVD risk score was a little high. So this is somebody that I'm a little bit concerned about, especially with her family history. So, oh crap, look at the bottom number. <laughs> so this is where we get into lipoprotein little a. So she's got a very high amount of something called lipoprotein little a. So lipoprotein little a is a type of LDL particle. So it is an LDL, but it's got this extra kringle on the outside called apolipoprotein little a. And this extra apolipoprotein makes it more atherogenic. So it's stickier. It likes to stay in the wall of the endothelial lining. And so patients with this are at eight to 10 times more risk for heart disease, significant risk. This is more common than familial hyperlipidemia. You're gonna see this in about one in five to one in six of your patients. It is genetic. So everyone, every single one of your patients, you should check an a, um, a lipoprotein little a at some point in their life. I usually tell patients that probably um, 20s, 30s is when you should start thinking about checking it. And the picture up here is Arthur Ashe. I, I have his picture for a couple of different reasons. So he was a famous tennis player in the 1970s and he got his first heart attack in his 40s. So he had this, this genetic problem. When you have an elevated amount of lipoprotein little a, like my poor patient here, you cannot out diet or exercise this. This is genetic. Um, it is a risk enhancing factor all by itself. So the other reason I put his picture up here is just so you can remember lipoprotein little a, Arthur Ashe is African-American and has lipoprotein little a. It is more prevalent in African-Americans. So this is where we need to be a little bit carefuler with certain populations. Um, and so it's very, very important. So we'll, we'll talk more about this, but any, any questions about lipoprotein little a? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about that. All right. <laughs> yes. So this is another patient of mine, 37 year old who has ulcerative colitis and Hashimoto's because autoimmune things travel together. She's on Lialda, um, levothyroxine, famotidine, and her father had his first heart attack in at 40. He was not a smoker, which by the way, smoking bad for your arteries. Cholesterol, bad for your arteries. High blood pressure, bad for your arteries. So this is focusing on lipids. I'm not trying to say lipids are the whole thing, but um, her father did not have those other risk factors. So when I did her testing, her lipoprotein little a was 220, so it's pretty high. We did a coronary artery calcium score, which we're gonna talk more about, and it was zero. Um, so what do I do now? She's 37, what should I do? So ASCVD risk scores you don't do until they turn 40. Should I wait? No, <laughs> no. And the other thing you need to do when you have a patient like this, so you want to treat them early and aggressively, and we're going to talk more about that. But the other thing unique to this genetic disorder is that the lipoprotein little a particle, for whatever reason, has an affinity for the aortic valve. So these patients are going to be at higher risk for aortic valve stenosis. So you need to listen for murmurs. You need to think about echoes. The earlier we identify that, the better. So in her especially, I'm, go I'm going to be very diligent about monitoring for that. Another case, I have a 43-year-old um, healthcare provider patient of mine with a um, pretty healthy guy. That's why I'm showing the barbells there hyperlipidemia and insomnia. He has been on several statins and had a lot of issues. It was interfering with his workouts. And so he is doing fine on patavastatin or Livolo. So if you're not familiar with Livolo, you have to fail three statins before insurance will approve that a lot of times. And 
it's kind of like the Cadillac of statins. It's it's similar to if you're with PPIs like Dexalant, which is the Cadillac of PPIs. So you can get it covered. It just takes a little bit of work. And so he's doing very well with that. He does have a, a family history, not a dramatic family history, and he's a healthy guy. So his, you know, generally his weight's good and blood pressure's good and all those things. What you're seeing on the right of his labs is when he said, you know what, I, I wonder if I really need to be taking a statin. I'm a young guy, I'm healthy, I eat healthy. Like, I wonder what it looks like when I'm not taking medication. So he stopped taking statins. And if you look at the very bottom, his lipoprotein little a is elevated because anything above 75 is going to turn orange and Cerner. So that would be elevated. And his apolipoprotein B was elevated and his LDL cholesterol was elevated. So not 190s, but 170s. We did a CAC score and it was zero. We're going to talk more about that. So because of the lipoprotein little a in this patient and because of his particle number being elevated and his family history, we put him back on patavastatin. And we're going to consider that to be significant enough of a risk factor that it really has diet and exercise. That's part of the picture, but it's not going to do all the work that we need to do. Yeah. We back to the statins for a second. If you need to fail for B to get pivastatin covered, but if they're qualifying for pivastatin, aren't you probably only doing the pivastatin for pivastatin first? Like, how do you get to three in those scenarios or how do you get around that? No, no. You, usually you have to try like... Um, <clears throat> atorvastatin, rosuvastatin, or patavastatin, or lovastatin. Okay. So, you, you know, you, yeah, you have to fail. No, yeah. Unfortunately, generally with most insurances, patavastatin would be their fourth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's not always the case. I've had certain payers that give me no issues with patavastatin, but a lot of them sometimes do. It's the March on a stat. Oh. Yep. So why? What did you? Why did you ask that question? Um, it's interesting. No, it, yeah, because it it could be a little better, right? Yeah. yeah. So so it's something we're watching because we may decide to do more. We're gonna we're gonna talk about that. So <clears throat> why am I pushing you guys to put twenty and thirty and forty year olds on medication? There's a concept of cholesterol years, kind of like pack years, right? So for those of you interested in investing and, and you know, retiring early, like Dr. Isan, I'm looking right at you, mm -hmm. we can appreciate the importance of compound interest, compounding, right? The longer the exposure to high amounts of particles, the more plaque you're building up, the more disease state you're feeding into. So the research is saying that if we wait in the middle arrow for people that are not obviously at risk, and we wait till their 50s, 60s, it's almost like too late at that point to make a significant impact in their future risk of events. But if we identify them in their 20s and 30s, we're going to get them kind of on the normal part of that curve. And so this is just showing you extremes, like people with homozygous <laughs> genetic disorders that get you know events in their 20s, and then people that are have a mutation that protects them against disease. And so they don't see events till their 80s. Now that I'm in my 40s, I, I don't want to have an event in my 50s, 60s. It's a lot closer now than it was before. So we don't want to wait till our patients are in their 50s. We, we've got to start to try and identify this earlier. So I had a 72-year-old patient of mine with lupus and polymyalgia rheumatica. She's on Plaquenil and steroids. She takes a baby aspirin, blood pressure medication, <clears throat> and lovastatin 10 milligrams. She has a very significant family history um, of her father having heart disease in his 60s, and he also had a stroke. And her traditional lipid numbers on the lovastatin were pretty good. Like her LDL um, was low and her HDL was high, <clears throat> but because she sees me, because of her family history, I did a coronary artery calcium score. 
If you've never seen a coronary artery calcium score, it looks at calcium within different arteries in the heart. And so if you look at her numbers, her LAD um, is in the 200s. And we'll talk about how anything over 100 is concerning. So this is concerning. Like she's already showing evidence of disease in her widowmaker artery and all these things. So the question is, should I change her statin and what dose should she be on? And how do I prevent this from progressing? So our current guidelines, it's a little bit tricky because <clears throat> she doesn't meet the criteria for a high intensity statin because she hasn't had an event. How many of you are comfortable leaving her where she's in? <laughs> so the problem is our current guidelines, they, they wait for you to have an event. Like they want you to have clinical ASCVD <laughs> to be on a high intensity. So heart attack, stroke, you needed a stent, you, you needed a, you know, you needed a bypass surgery. Um, so that's when we do the high intensity statin. Or um, if you have an LDL above 190, or if you have diabetes and you fall into a higher risk category. So, so I think all of you can appreciate, since I'm trying to emphasize, it's too late. <laughs> like that's too late. We, sh we shouldn't be waiting till my poor lady has a stroke. So we're gonna intensify her therapy. And if you're gonna use the high intensity statin, I mentioned that it was either a torvastatin or rosuvastatin. So how do we know what doses are high intensity? Those two medications come in four doses, and Crestor is half the dose of Lipitor, right? So Lipitor, the highest dose is 80, and Crestor, the highest dose is 40, right? So Lipitor, 80, 40, 20, 10. Crestor, 40, 20, 10, 5. The top two are the high intensity. So if you can just remember that the top two doses are the high intensity, right? So if the highest dose of Lipitor is 80 and the highest dose of Crestor is 40, what's half that? Those are the other two. Those are the other two, right? So for our patients that have had events or we're worried they're gonna have an event, or our patients with LDL above 190, our patients in a very high risk category, like that 20% category on your chart, or our diabetics that are also in that intermediate risk category, but they have diabetes. Those are the ones we want on a high intensity statin. So I have another patient of mine, 76 year old male with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, prediabetes. He's had heart problems. He um, had a small heart attack in 2019. So he's on a baby aspirin, 20 milligram Crestor. He's on an ACE. And he did labs, he did an advanced cholesterol panel, and there's some wonderful cardiologists in the Baycare system that are current with these guidelines and, and looking at the research that's coming out. So this patient's <clears throat> LDL cholesterol looked pretty good. It was 64 on the 20 milligram Crestor, but the cardiologist saw the triglycerides and said, wait a second, even though he's on a high intensity statin, I don't like the high triglycerides. So the reason for that is something called the um, REDUCE IT trial. And you, you remember I said it was 2018 guidelines. So the REDUCE IT trial, the research from that came out in 2019. So it came out a little bit after the guidelines. <clears throat> and it showed that if you treat the LDL to goal, but you have patients with high triglycerides, you will lower their risk of stroke and cardiovascular events by putting them on Vicepa, which is icosapent ethyl. Icosapent ethyl is like a purified fish oil. Yeah, you had the price? Yeah. It's a purified fish oil. So we're going to talk more about the why this is difficult because cost, like that is a big issue with this medication, but there is more to lowering your patient's risk than just putting them on a statin. So if you have a patient that has had an event or is at high risk for having an event, you should be thinking about non-statin therapies. So generally it's for patients that either don't have an LDL that's at goal, and we're gonna talk about what the LDL goal should be, 
or maybe they have these other factors like the high triglycerides that would make you want to be more aggressive. The three that I want you guys to take away from the lecture that we need to start using more is Zetia or Azetamibe. And that is the first one that we go to with our current guidelines if their LDL is not at goal. So Zetia would be the first one. The second one, I'm going to skip to the other part of the slide, is a PCSK9 inhibitor like Freluent or Repatha. So we're going to talk a little bit more about those. And the third one you'd want to think about is this the SEPA or icosapent ethyl. And that is specifically for patients with high triglycerides or diabetes or metabolic syndrome. So if, if you don't remember the other ones that I'm going to talk about, those three would be the ones that we should start using more. So what is a PCSK9 inhibitor? What, why is this important? Um, you don't have to remember how it works, but basically your statins and other medications inhibit cholesterol synthesis in the liver. What the PCSK9 inhibitors are doing is making more LDL receptors so that you're getting LDL particles cleared out of the bloodstream. That's like the basics of it. So it, the mechanism of action is different, but it's lowering the particle number. Uh, notice I didn't say it's lowering cholesterol. It's lowering the particle number, which is very, very important. The other thing that I will mention, although it's not something that is guiding treatment, statins do not lower lipoprotein little a. Statins are important because they lower all of your um, LDL particles and a lot of your atherogenic particles. It definitely improves your risk, but it doesn't lower lipoprotein little a. So there is a lot of research being done on PCSK9 inhibitors because they do. <laughs> they do lower lipoprotein little a. So when you asked, like, does that change our treatment to be continued? Because we're starting to see if targeting lowering lipoprotein little a does better for that subset of patients, but it, it, it's ongoing research. So for my young patients that have that genetic abnormality and they're not tolerating statins, I say talk to your cardiologist about Freluent and Repatha because it, it may benefit you more than other patients. So this is again just to say that <clears throat> always start with the statin. If they're not at goal with your statin, think about Zetia. If they're not tolerating statins, think about Zetia. If they're, and also think about PCSK9s. PCSK9s lower lipoprotein A. And in your patients who can afford it, that have diabetes and high triglycerides, and they're already on a statin, <clears throat> go ahead and think about the SEPA or icosapen ethyl because it may help that subset of patients. The last two, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail, but you guys are really young doctors in the room, and I promise you, you're going to be recommending the two medications at the bottom within the next five to 10 years. So, Enclizaran is also an injectable medication like the PCSK9s that <clears throat> um, kind of like our COVID vaccines, it targets the RNA of the PCSK9. So, it doesn't block. PCSK9, but it targets the RNA of PCSK9, so it kind of works on the same place. Increases LDL receptors to take particles out of the bloodstream, so it also lowers lipoprotein little a, but it's currently in research. I have a couple patients that have been on it because they're, they're in trials. Bempedoic acid was, re and, and I'll mention too, bempedoic acid was an oral medication for lowering LDL cholesterol that um, works in the liver and is really good to think about for statin intolerant patients because it doesn't cause myalgias, it doesn't affect the muscles as much as statins do. And it was recently in the New England Journal because it definitely lowers um, cardiovascular events, but to be continued. I, I really just want you guys to see those names because it will be something that we're doing. All right, yeah. Sorry, can you say the, for the, the... Oh, it's like Levique, Levique. 
Levika or Levik or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, Levikia, you know, something like that. Um, all right, so we're we're gonna kind of to be continued. I've got a little bit more to go. Sixty, and this guy just saw me, sixty-three year old, who smokes, which is unfortunate. Um, treated Hep C, pre-diabetes, hyperlipidemia. He came to me with this big old scar on his neck because we um, found out he had about 90% um, occlusion in his carotid. So he had surgery. He's on 40 milligram atorvastatin, which is a high dose, right? 40 and 80. Lisinopril, amlodipine, aspirin. These are his vitals. And when I did his labs, his LDL was 107. And if you look at the very bottom, his lipoprotein little a was 301. So what do we think about this guy's risk for future events? It's like super high. He smokes. He's got this genetic thing going on. So what should we do with his medications? Yeah, yeah, right? We got options. We could intensify. We could up his atorvastatin, right? We could add stuff. He has a little bit of elevated triglycerides, but his cardiologist tried prescribing Vicepa and it was too expensive. Um, we could definitely add Zetia, right? And that's gonna lower his risk. In the Reduce It trial, uh, Zetia was studied in patients that already had an LDL cholesterol about 70. And they added Zetia and it significantly lowered their cardiovascular risk. And so, He's so high risk. I would definitely intensify his statin. I would put him on Zetia. And so where should we try to get that LDL to? 2022 American College Cardiology Guidelines say less than 55 is what we should get. It's so low. Yeah. So we're used to less than 70, right? We're used to less than 70. And there's a lot of providers that say, isn't we isn't cholesterol, you know, doesn't it make hormones and it's good for our brain? And isn't that low dangerous? No. <laughs> no. Physiologically, we're okay at levels of 10, 10 to 20. So getting it down to 55 is not a bad. Thing. Do you want your patient to be at 10? No, <laughs> no. So this is the current recommendations from the American College of Cardiology. In high risk patients on statin therapy, you want to try to get their LDL less than 55. Um, and the other thing is just to kind of mention the medications, we're still recommending Zetamide, Zetia, and PCSK9 inhibitors first. If those aren't getting your patient to goal, they're putting in the new guidelines, bempedoic acid and enclizaran. So this is coming, like these are coming. I see comments, any questions? Is Okay, all right, yes. So why aren't the guidelines using APOB instead of LDLs? Ah. They follow up those and such. I mean, this is yeah. as important as APOB. It, it just, that's a really good question. Dr. Brennan asked, why are we, why are we looking at LDL and not APOB? Because, and a lot of the big studies that have been done have traditionally been LDL, and that's just been the standard for a long time. So it's definitely going to change because a lot of the other, like in Europe, they're more aggressive about looking at APOB and other countries, but it takes time for us all to change. We're just very comfortable with LDL. We're, we're very comfortable with LDL. It's it's hard for us to change. So that's why the, the European guidelines tend to be a little bit more aggressive than the American guidelines. And this is just to show you, this is not just America. So in Europe and their guidelines where they tend to be very evidence-based and doing a lot of research as well, in their high-risk patients, they're also less than 55. They also are recommending statin and then Zetia and then PCSK9 inhibitors. So it's very similar to what we're moving towards, but we're just a little bit behind them. We're, we're a little bit behind what they've been doing already. All right, so we're getting close to the end. 58-year-old with hypertension, sleep apnea. Who do, He doesn't want to wear a CPAP. Um, he's got some back issues. He wants the tea shots, all these things. And, and he comes in and he's like, Doc, I'm feeling really tired. I said, well, you need a CPAP. But anyway, 
Um, so he's on Olmosartan. He takes his testosterone. His dad had a heart attack in his 40s. He was a smoker. His blood pressure is that, um, and he's on those T-shots. Remember, T-shots do increase your blood pressure. So we talked about that. Is He's fluffy, too. He's a little bit fluffy. Um, before we talk about his labs, I, I just wanted to remind you, and this comes from the American College of Cardiology, the major risk factors for atherosclerotic disease, the three, the three that a lot of lipidologists and, and researchers and cardiologists will tell you, APOB, tobacco, hypertension. So we cannot ignore his blood pressure. So it's just as important to get that blood pressure down as it is to kind of get him on statins and all this kind of lipid stuff. So those are the three, APOB, smoking, and hypertension. So I did his labs. His LDL is 89. His APOB on the right is 73. It's green, which is good, right? Some of these reports will give you a green, yellow, red. His lipoprotein A is low. His, he's got an inflammatory marker, but um, his ASCVD score is 10.3. And that does put you in a category if you're looking at your little cards and your, your guidelines that He's an intermediate risk, and so we should consider a statin. And I tell him all this, and he's like, no. Like, I, I do I have to? I don't really have it. You know, yeah, my dad had heart disease, but he was a smoker. Like, is it important? So the last part of this talk is about <laughs> PAC scores. So in the guidelines, it recommends that if they're borderline or they're intermediate risk, or, you know, that, that's usually where it's the most beneficial and you're on the fence, and you're kind of wondering, am I really getting a full picture of the risk? You would do something called a coronary artery calcium score. I did his. Do we like that? Yeah. So who thinks we would have missed that if we didn't have done that test? Like, you know, yeah, I would have one year ago, I, I would have been more aggressive with his blood pressure. I would have told him to lose weight, um, tried to get him to wear the CPAP machine, but would I have put him on a statin? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. His LDL was 89. Am I gonna push him to take a statin now? Yeah. He's got a lot of calcium deposits and so, this is showing you that the CAC or the coronary artery calcium score, the, the number I want you to remember is 100. So if it's zero, that can be really reassuring to patients, although there is false negatives. Generally, a score of zero is reassuring, and you can tell them that we can just watch and wait and all those good things. If it's anywhere between zero and 100, eh, you know, it's not scary, but, you know, it may, you know, you want to think about it a little bit. If it's over 100, that's bad. It's bad. And the reason is when you start to get it over 100, there's a lot more advanced atherosclerotic disease. And so these are the people that we really, really want to start to worry about. So this is why when I sent you guys the email, I mentioned the recent um, JAMA publication that just came out in May, where if you look at this graph from that article, even patients with an ASCVD risk score of less than five, which is in the low risk category, look how many of those have coronary artery calcium scores above 300. And so are we potentially missing patients by just looking at the LDL and the ASCVD and the hypertension and the smoking? And the answer is yes. <laughs> we, we definitely need to start thinking more about utilizing these tools, especially if they have a family history. Okay, so who feels like they have a better understanding of APOB, lipoprotein little a, and CAC scoring? Okay, yay! Any, oh, last thing. So why do I care, so, I'm gonna like cry. <laughs> why do I care so much? This was a patient of mine that, um, in 2016, this is his actual photo. <laughs> and he came to see me for his physical. He was, you guys, probably, some of you heard this story. He was super excited. He was retiring from the, the postal service. And 
you know, I wasn't happy about his cholesterol. It was a little off. And he said, you know what, doc, like I'm about to retire. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to exercise. I, I don't have a significant family history. Like let's give it three months and, and we'll kind of watch it. And I said, yeah, okay. And, you know, back then the guidelines were very different. So he didn't have diabetes. He wasn't a smoker. This is somebody that's very active. He did not have any other risk factors. He did not have hypertension, none of those things. He died a month later after I did his physical. His wife, who's still my patient, called me very distraught. And she said, how did you miss it? How did you miss it? So I feel very compelled to teach other physicians like to understand lipids better and to understand the risk factors better because I never want you to go through this. <laughs> um, and fortunately, she, you know, she forgave me. I, I see her um, mom for home visits who's 91 and I see her and I see a lot of her friends and neighbors, but this is the guy that started these talks. So anyway, don't, don't let this happen to you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. You can't see it. Yeah. 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 56. Not a smoker, not hypertension, all those things. Um, yeah, his ASCVD risk score, we didn't have that back then, but it was low. Yeah, it was low because I did that with my other talks. So there's a recorded grand rounds um, for Baycare from last year. And his, I, I, I can't remember it offhand, but it was low. But in 2016, we weren't doing risk scoring. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Questions, yeah. <laughs> yeah, could you comment like for the CAC score, right? So you treat it aggressively, potentially you know, it's high and risk factors. You're not going to change your CAC score as far as lowering it with lipid management, right? So well, that's a really good question. Actually, when you put people on statins and you're more aggressively treating them, their CAC score may actually go up. So if you look in PubMed and you look from, from people that are skeptics of, of using CAC scores and statins and, you know, the, the, the stuff that we're talking about, you, there is literature to show that the CAC score will go up. So why do you think that is? We're, we're not going to fix calcified arterial walls. And so you're, you're changing the composition of that um, plaque but you're not going to make the calcium go away. <laughs> so you're going to have some plaque regression. We have very good studies to show plaque regression and less events and all that kind of stuff, but you're not going to reverse the calcification. So you don't want to use the score to guide therapy. You want to use the score to understand their risk. Does that make sense? Okay. Patients might get disgruntled though, right? They're gonna yes. be treating themselves aggressively and the score yep. is going up, they're gonna get like homework, yep. right? They're gonna freak out. Yeah, that, that's when you try to really tell them to focus on the APOB. And you know, um when Dr. Tran was asking about how do you help patients understand that, I, I usually that's why I gave you guys these kind of little things to I, I use this today with a patient, you know, and I said. Your LDL cholesterol doesn't really tell me what's going on with these things. And so I, I want you to have less of these things floating around your blood. And so if we measure, you look at the little blue thing on those spheres, that's an ApoB. And if you have less ApoB, you have less of these things. And so, you know, just trying to break it down for them and, and simplify it. But, you know, sometimes you have to send those patients to cardiology and, and be picky about which cardiologists, because we want to think that our cardiologists do this better than we do, I will tell you they do not. <laughs> so um, there are several within Baycare that are good and, and are looking at these things. And there are some that I've had to just send my patient to a different cardiologist because they missed it and they minimized it and my patients had events. So be skeptical uh, when your cardiologist is minimizing it and tell the cardiologist this comes from the American College of Cardiology. <laughs> so this is not like, you know, voodoo. It's not voodoo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. The CAC, is that covered by insurance? Which one? The CAC. Oh, the CAC score. 
That's another good question. Generally, um, it is covered. For patients where it's not covered, uh, like BayCare, for instance, has a rate of $99. So if they had to pay out of pocket, it would be $99. It's been covered for all of my patients if they have hyperlipidemia and a family history, or they have elevated lipoprotein little a, or I put tobacco use in there, and they have some risk factors with the coating, it's always covered. And the other good question is, do you use contrast or do you not use contrast? So that can give you more information to use contrast, but I generally don't um, because you can get a good CAC score without contrast. Although I've had some patients where their CAC score is kind of a little less than 100 and we're on the fence because not all atherosclerotic plaque is calcified. So then I wish I would have done that contrast. So I will either order it with contrast or send them to cardiology. So I, I had one just recently. I sent it, just sent them to cardiology. Um, and then another question, just when you're like, you're doing your results, you know, what if I have like a really poor, what if I got like a four, I don't even know if you can get a four. Like yeah, a yeah, <laughs> you can get a 400, yeah. Um, is there a certain point at which you're like, uh-huh. Yep. Cardiology. Yep. So so I just had a patient of mine who has a very elevated lipoprotein delay, uh, female patient, non-smoker, not hypertensive, you know, all the, all those things. And her CAC was in the 400s, either 390s or 400. And she was fishing with her husband and her son and got chest pain, went to the ER, and it was a negative workup, but it was with exertion, she had diaphoresis. <laughs> and so I wrote a letter to the cardiologist and I said, she needs a cath. <laughs> and I don't, you know, somebody having classic angina, I don't think that's gonna be a hard sell to the cardiologist, but sometimes you do have to advocate for your patient and, and make sure you have the right cardiologist and make sure you're sending that letter saying, you know, I'm concerned because my patient, according to ACC guidelines, <laughs> has this risk enhancing factor and should, you know, blah, 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 use the terms that that speak their language. And, and you may have to advocate for that. So I had a patient that I did, um, was worried about and had an abnormal CAC, and this was last year, and I sent him and the cardiologist was like, eh, I'm not going to do anything. I won't tell you which cardiologist that was. So I sent him to another cardiologist and he had a stent. He had like a 90% occluded LED lesion. So you, you do have to um, advocate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is there um, any new recent evidence like removing side effects for stents? You know, all the patients think it's going to like kill them. That's not, but I find. Yeah. If there's anything that would be helpful. Yeah, I'll try to find you a good patient facing source, but in the grand rounds talk I did, there's a lot of research on what is the prevalence of diabetes and dementia with statins and the, the risk of myalgias. So generally you can expect that maybe 10% or so of your patients might have myalgias. I tell patients that once you stop the statin, it generally goes away. So you're not going to get rhabdo from statins, that would be very rare, like extremely rare. Um, it's also very, very rare. Like the incidence of diabetes is like one in 100,000 and the incidence of potential memory issues is like one in 200,000 or some ridiculous statistics. So it's very, very low. And, you know, the trick is to try and help guide your patients towards the American Heart Association and, and the CDC and, and not Wikipedia, you know, to look up what they're reading about statins. All right. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you for listening.